think with me back uh, five months ago. Five months ago, it was uh, November, kind of getting on to Thanksgiving time. Maybe, uh, maybe it was snowing then, cold, kind of probably the same exact temperature five months ago. Still in 2021. A- anybody, like you were excited that it was snowing today? No, but Aaron, you were excited. Oh, good. Uh, I was not. Uh, but five months ago, kind of preparing for Thanksgiving, um, I was uh, just beginning this, uh, this chaplaincy program that I did over at Methodist Hospital. Five months ago, I joined a rock climbing gym. Anybody here ever been rock climbing? Uh, anybody here, you would never, ever do rock climbing, too afraid of heights, all that kind of stuff. Um, I only do the ones where you're like strapped in, but I've been in this for five months now, and you can tell by like my muscular physique and my guns that it's paying off my once a week workout that I go do. Um, but hey, you can come with me for 10 bucks if you want to come rock climbing with me as my guest. But I've been, you know, progressing. I've been getting better with different uh, skills and things. And so a couple of weeks ago, we had some family in town and we had some missionaries in town. If you were here for Pastor Arturo and Ruth when they came. And we thought, what, what, what a better thing to do than to, for the crazy busy weekend, to take them all rock climbing. So we did. Saturday morning. Because um, we had missionaries come. It's kind of fun to do some different fun things with them. So we took them rock climbing. And so my sister-in-law and then my niece, Lucia, were there. And so most of the adults, because they were newer, had to be trained in how to do this. Uh, and so I was left with the children, the four children. And so I'm trying as my best to, like, make sure they don't die and to help them as they're rock climbing. And they're strapped in. It's fine. It's good. But the youngest one, Lucia, she would just kind of, like, Uh, you know, get close to the wall, and then she'd pull the rope back as far as she could and let it go, and it would kind of pull her back this way, and trying to figure out how to do this, and I'm trying to, like, manage them, and finally, they could all rock climb, the adults, too, and and if you've ever been, you know, the most fun part is to climb up the rock wall, and then to jump down and let it kind of pull you down as you're jumping, but um, Ruth, uh, who was a little afraid and scared of the whole climbing part of it, would just kind of slowly climb back down and not jump off. How many of you would do that? You would would not jump off at the very top. Okay. I was a youth pastor for a number of years. And so this has been my thing lately. I get to do this on my own usually and go rock climb and have a good time without any students or youth ministry stuff. But, you know, a lot can change in five months. Five months ago... At the church, we started going through the book of Luke. We, we began it as kind of our, our Christmas uh, sermon series. And today we've come to the end of it. We're in the very last chapter of the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24. And if you've, you've missed some of those things or this is your first time, uh, don't, don't worry at all. Um, Luke begins his whole um, book by saying, I'm writing this to you. He's writing to a friend, and he, he wants to tell his friend of the entire book of Luke about the life of Jesus. He's a, he's a doctor, and so he's very detailed. Uh, he likes to know the truth, and so he wants to write to his friend what Jesus said and did so that, he says, uh, his friend, and that I think us too can have certainty about these things. And this is important for us, right? Because all of this stuff we're talking about, Jesus, death, resurrection, all this happened 2,000 years ago. Yeah, we want to have certainty that all of these things actually happened. So Luke begins to talk about how he was born and the special events uh, surrounding that. He begins to talk about his, his ministry, how he taught people with parables, and how he healed people who were blind and diseased, how he would hang out with, with sinners and prostitutes, and, and it just made the religious leaders angry and upset. Why are you with these people? And he would teach and he would talk about his, 
his mission, his purpose for why he came. And we talked about this one verse over and over again. This is Luke 19. It says, For the Son of Man, for Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. His whole purpose, the whole reason why Jesus came was to seek out, to find, and to then save, to help lost people, which may be exactly where where you are and, and where you're feeling, or even on a Sunday Easter morning, you just feel lost. That was Jesus' whole mission, was to help the lost. And so how did he do that? Well, last week, we talked about what's known as Palm Sunday. In fact, everything, all of his life has been leading up to this one last week. And we, we dedicate kind of a week and then the church calendar to talk about Jesus last week. And so on Sunday, the last kind of Sunday of his life, he enters into Jerusalem, this, this city that's full of people for a holiday. And he comes riding in on a donkey with palm branches and cloaks being thrown down. People are shouting, and all of his followers are shouting out with a loud voice that says, they're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We've chosen for our theme, our, our kind of talking points for this whole weekend, these two things king and glory these things are shouting blessed is the king glory in the highest jesus the king of glory and as he comes into town there's this excitement there there there's people talking about this the king is coming maybe some of the jews are reminded of this psalm 24 it says about the city of jerusalem lift up your heads o gates be lifted up, O ancient doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who, who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who, who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. And so here He is, He's come, He's come to maybe defeat kind of undo all the Roman rule and authority that's over top of them to set up his own kingdom. But on Thursday of that week, he is betrayed by one of his own close friends. He's arrested, and on Friday, he's put on trial. He's mocked, um, scourged beaten, he's put on a cross, hands, feet with nails and then head with a crown of thorns. He dies, he's buried on Friday. And on Saturday, nothing happens. There's, there's no joyful worship songs. There's nothing. There, there's no Easter egg hunt like we had here yesterday. There's no candy and that kind of thing. Um, I, I have to admit that after we had our Easter egg hunt yesterday, I did go through my kids' candy bags and take the best of the candy. And they also, their parents, oh, well, your kids are still in here. Don't, don't raise your hands, parents. They will know. I mean, it, this psalm here talks about, like, who is the king of glory? I mean, maybe they're all kind of thinking right now, like, where, where, what happened? Where is the king of glory? But the amazing truth that we come to celebrate on this Sunday is that Jesus' death was just the beginning of his inauguration of his kingdom and his glory. I mean, Jesus, the king of glory, was about to show himself, but, but, even like his death, his, his showing of himself, his resurrection coming back to life was totally unexpected and not what you might think for a king coming in his glory. You might expect a king to come with 
uh, majesty and kind of a golden crown, or I, I picture a king with like that kind of red robe with like the furry white thing around them. And Jesus coming in his inauguration of his kingdom of glory was different, unexpected. So this morning, as we look at Luke 24, there's three things. Three things I want you to kind of just notice, these kind of facts, these truths about Jesus and his kingdom and his glory as it is unleashed. And then one final kind of application point that we're going to hear about. So if you've got your Bible or if you've got a, a phone with a Bible app or you can kind of Google it, go to Luke chapter 24. The first thing we're going to see is that Jesus' glorious kingdom even came with doubt. So early Sunday morning, women who were uh, surrounding Jesus and his ministry, supporting him, doing ministry with him, they come on Sunday morning early, it says, um, dawn before the sun is even up to take care of the body. They're sad. They think he is still dead at this point. They, they come to the tomb, the, the, the stone that, that's in front of this tomb that's usually very heavy and, and hard to roll away has been rolled away. And they go in and, and they don't see anything inside. It's empty. And look with me at verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. But is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, of sinful men, and be crucified on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. It's told throughout the, the these four gospels, which Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell this story, that women are the first ones to come to the tomb to even see Jesus. And so, I mean, Awesome, you know, score one for women in history for doing this amazing thing, being there at the tomb, the very first ones, and to see Jesus. But then they go back and they tell the other disciples, the other men, and look what happens in verse 11. But, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb Stooping and, and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. They didn't even believe these women, thought it was just some sort of idle tale or story they're making up. Maybe they're really tired or they're sad or any of those things. Um, maybe you've had those experiences in your own life where you told somebody something and they didn't even believe you or didn't trust you. Um, like, like we have a, a guy on staff here, um, Dennis, who often says things joking, and I never know what to believe. And so I've learned that you never believe the first thing he says, always the second thing, because the first thing is always wrong. Or would you believe me that, you know, like a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Arturo was here, um, I was driving in the car with him. He speaks Spanish. I don't speak Spanish very well, but I have, a, I have an app, and I spoke into my phone. Um, uh, Arturo, do you get nervous before you preach? And then it translated to, I get nervous when you preach. <laughs> you may not believe me if you thought that was true or not, but um, there was also a thing that I did on April Fool's. Um, I... I've had a beard for a long time. I've had a goatee since I was 16 years old. I don't, I don't know if I have a chin anymore. Um, but I found a, a thing to, um, you know, digitally take off my beard on Snapchat and, you know, put a picture. And to this day, there's still people that don't know that I did not do that. Like, my mom was confused for weeks on end. Or April and Joe, they put up 
uh, on Facebook that they were moving to California. This is not funny. <laughs> People were angry at you guys. <laughs> But this is no April Fool's Day joke. This is no, like, them trying to persuade someone that doesn't happen. They are convinced. They know that this is what happened. And just think of all the emotions. Look at all the emotions that they're, 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 they're going through in this time. They're, they're frightened. They're scared. They're confused. They're perplexed. Uh, there's this disbelief there, too. Peter is running to the tomb, and he's marveling afterwards, too. And I, I, I know that on a Sunday morning, on Easter morning, that that. Similar emotions can be going on. And I want to say that because that is okay. Even at the very first resurrection, the very first Easter Sunday, there was doubt, there was confusion, there was uh, perplexed people. <laughs> A lot of times people come to church when they're frightened. They, 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 they need answers. They need help in some way. A lot of times they come... <laughs> on a holiday, on Christmas or Easter, and they don't believe. They, they just have a lot of doubts or, I, I don't know about this whole Jesus guy rising from the dead. Um, maybe you were drugged here by a spouse or a parent or a friend. or I, I don't know. That's okay. I'm glad you are here. And that was there even at the very first Easter. But the truth is, the second point I want to tell you about, even though there was doubt at the very first Easter, the truth is that Jesus has this um, uh, ability, he has this power to make us to see, to open our eyes. Only Jesus can open our eyes to see his glory. Now, later that day, that Sunday when he had risen, Two of his disciples uh, begin this journey. They're, they're leaving Jerusalem, going toward this city named Emmaus. And they're, they're talking to each other about all these things that have happened. And look with me at verse 15. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Jesus uh, kind of begins to walk alongside them. And it says they don't recognize him at first. I mean, he's not wearing a mask. Or has a funny accent going on. There's something going on here. I mean, you know, maybe, I mean, they've had a really crazy week. Uh, I don't know about you. My family has been crazy busy lately. We've got three kids. We have five different activities with like piano and track and football and baseball and soccer. And um, no lie, we had our first baseball practice last week and my son thought it was backyard baseball and like pegged the kid with the baseball. Um, but maybe they were just really busy and they had lots of stuff going on. They didn't know how to, emotions and oh, I, I don't recognize Jesus. No, there's something deeper, I think even spiritual going on here that they don't recognize him yet for a reason. And it's because only Jesus can open their eyes to see his glory and who he truly is. So they begin to tell him what's been happening here in the city. Verse 19, halfway through, they tell him, well, I mean, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, he was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our rulers, they, they delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We, we thought he was going to be the king coming in glory. And besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. And some of our women in our company amazed us. They, they went to the tomb early in the morning, and, and when they didn't find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive, and some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. 
you get this, this feeling of, 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 of longing, of sadness, of confusion they're going through that we, we thought he was going to be the one. We thought he was going to be the, the leader to come in and defeat every you know, sin and the Romans and all this stuff, and he just died. Have you ever experienced that kind of crushing hope? You want something so bad and it doesn't happen or you think it's going to happen. I, uh, I put on yesterday this new armband um, going tomorrow with a group. There's five of us from the church going to this, this conference in Louisville, Kentucky. And I know sometimes like a conference sounds really boring, but this is like a really boring nerdy pastor conference that I'm going to and I'm really excited about because I get to go for like three days and listen to like really good preachers preach for like an hour, like 10 of them all in a row. Like I know that's really exciting to me. And I get like a whole stack of books, like 15 free, um, this is literally like 15 free books, big books. And they have like a discounted bookstore where I will buy even more books. But don't tell my wife because she's not in the service. But two years ago, it got canceled or put online because of the pandemic. I've, I've been going to this conference for like a long time, since 2010. And the, the, there's this, this idea that, that there's different kinds of Kevin. There's like mission trip Kevin and conference Kevin. So I, I like this conference. And so like two years ago, my hopes were dashed. Like could not go to Louisville and actually attend this thing. So I'm really hoping the snow and all that stuff does not cancel T4G in this conference tomorrow. But... Man, that, that was a long little story about books and conference. There. <laughs> but they are hoping for something, and Jesus all of a sudden comes next to them. And look what Jesus says to them in verse 25. He says, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets had spoken. What, wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus, as he's walking with them, he begins to do this little Bible study with them of the Old Testament, all the places where it pointed to him. You know, when we get up to heaven, there'll be lots of people to meet and talk to, like, like Moses or Abraham, or maybe like your grandpa or your grandma, or maybe there'll be some like classes you'll take, like I want to learn to fly, I would like to do that in heaven, or I would like to learn to cook, I don't know if there'll be meat in heaven, but maybe some things like that, but one of the Bible studies I want to take is this one right here about show me Jesus like in the Old Testament, and, and maybe he went to that same kind of Psalm 24, right, that I read to you earlier about the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And Jesus says to this, this group of two, these disciples, this Bible study, he says, that, that was me. I, 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 was, I, I was the glory there that he's talking about. Or, or as he talks about Exodus and, and the glory coming over the mountains and, 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 and all this thunder and lightning and it says, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, or the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. Jesus says, that, that was me. That was my glory showing over those mountains. Or as Solomon finished the temple and he prays, fire comes down from heaven and consumes this offering. And it says, the glory filled the temple. And Jesus says, that, that was my glory glory that filled the temple or in psalm 19 where it talks about the, the, the heavens the sky everything creation declares the glory of the lord he would say that that was my glory jesus said that was mine and this this passage in isaiah isaiah 6 where it talks about isaiah sees this vision of the lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and and the train of now that his robe filled the temple and there's these angels flying around with six wings. They're covering their face and their feet and they're flying around. They're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
and the foundations and the thresholds shake at the voice of him who called out, and, and there's smoke, and Isaiah responds with this, I am lost, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. He realizes his sinfulness compared to his, the glory, and he says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, and, and Jesus says, that, that was me, that was my glory, that's my kingdom that he saw there. Or finally, at the end of the Old Testament, when Ezekiel talks about the temple and the glory going away from the temple because of the people's sinfulness, it rises up like this, this smoke, and the glory of the Lord went up in the midst and stood over to the east. Jesus said, that was my, that was me, that was the glory that you saw back then. As they keep walking along and hear this stuff from Jesus, all of a sudden they, they get to the place where they're stopping and they invite Jesus in, not knowing who he is, but their, their hearts are burning, their eyes are still closed, they don't know what's happening, they're, they want to be with him. It, it says that Jesus sat down at the table, he took some bread, broke it, blessed them, and handed it out. And it's in that moment that something happens, verse 31, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight, and, and they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? It's in his breaking of the bread, of just this kind of Lord's Supper communion moment where he takes this, this is my body, blood, all this, they, their eyes are opened, and I, I know that you, you may come to church, and it can be hard to see God's glory. I mean, we, we think of glory as like sunrise, or beautiful colors in the sky, or majesty, or that kind of thing, but we come, and it's just a guy in a purple shirt preaching a sermon. I mean, It is only by the power of God that our eyes can be opened to see his true glory. And if you're here this morning, like, I just, I want that. I don't see that. I, I don't get it. I doubt still. I, I pray that God would open your eyes to truly see his glory even today. Because the amazing thing is this, this third point, this third thing, not only do we just we see that Jesus opens their eyes and their heart is burning, all this. But this third thing is that Jesus is now, even now, he is the living king. Not as he glories, has a kingdom and all that, but he is our living king. These two disciples hurry back to Jerusalem. They meet up with the rest of uh, the disciples and they, they swap stories. They tell each other about what has happened um, some of them have seen Jesus already, and these two have seen him now, and they're, they're, they're surprised and excited and all these things. And look at verse 36 with me. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit or ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your heart? See my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate before them. They're, they're talking about this thing together that Jesus has, has been with people. They've seen him, and all of a sudden, he just appears with them, and they start freaking out because they think, ah, there's a ghost here. It's, it's the ghost of Jesus. I mean, they just saw him a little bit ago. I mean, but Jesus wants to kind of prove to them, to show them that he is real. I'm not just a ghost. I'm not like Casper the friendly ghost. Like I'm here. I'm actually real. He says, like, see my hands. Touch me. You know, see where the holes went in. All of these things. He shows them that he is 
real. And I know that's so hard because some of you are like, yeah, I, I just need that. <laughs> I just need Jesus or God to just be right in front of me so I can touch him and see him and feel him. But Jesus does something amazing with this group here in verse 44. He says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So first he kind of proves to them that I am real. See me, touch me. He, he even like takes some, some food. Like watch me eat this, this fish, this, this food here. I can, I can do this. I told you earlier that I was a youth pastor for a number of years, and as a, a youth pastor, um, you need to eat food, just in general, but you need to eat gross food. It's part of the job description that in order to be a youth pastor, you have to do gross, weird, dumb things sometimes. And so I, that's what I did as a youth pastor. I would prove to my students that I could do this and be cool with them by eating gross food. Um, you know, anything from like uh, drink pop through your neighbor's sock or um, stick a chair in your nose and see how far you can blow it out, um, you know, things like that. And so Jesus, in a less gross way, is, is trying to prove to these people that he is real. But then it says he opens their minds to understand the Old Testament. This whole group, this whole Bible study, he goes through again, and I think this time, what if he, he talked about how he was the king in the Old Testament? Again, that's Psalm 24. Maybe he looked at that and said, look, that king of glory, that was me. Or when God uh, talked to David in 2 Samuel 7 about a, a king coming after me, uh, after you, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you to establish your kingdom. Uh, he shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Jesus said that, that king that was talked about then, that was me. I am the king to come. Or Isaiah 9, it talks about, you know, a child is born, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, that kingdom judging kind of thing. He comes, he is that. Or this thing that we talked about even last week from Zechariah, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout and triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus looks through the Old Testament and says, look, all those places of glory, of kingship, that was me. That's who I am. But then he gets to the most important part. He opens their minds. They understand that he's living, that he is the king. And then he says this in verse 46. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. He says, all of this, all that has happened, my, my death, all that's talked about in the Old Testament, me being a king of glory, of, of the, my coming back to life, my, my resurrection, all of these things were to show, to prove to you that your sins have been forgiven. Jesus is the living king even today. I don't know what stuff you come in with today. I know from my own family, from talking to people in our church, talking to people around the country, that there is a lot of emotional baggage, a lot of family stuff, addiction, alcoholism, brokenness in, in our families, in our worlds, in our life here. And Jesus says that he is the king to come reign in your life, that the only way to come into that, that kingdom, that reigning, is to say, God, I, I repent of what I've done. And to lay your life into his life and to say, 
God, forgive me of my sins because that's what he did on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sins and he is reigning still. He's living still for you even today. And finally, last kind of application point. What do you do with all these facts, these things about Jesus reigning, kingdom, glory, all this? What do you do? Our last thing is that you can join his kingdom today. Notice the opposite emotions that we find at the end of this chapter than the beginning. Verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This chapter began with sadness of going to the tomb, of doubts, of confusion, of what is going on. And with Jesus' life, his, his resurrection, his What he has done, it brings joy and worship and then friendship together. And you are invited into this kingdom to not just come today, Christmas or Easter or holiday, and come to church. I mean, this is what the kingdom looks like. The kingdom is coming every day, every week to bow down and worship and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your forgiveness. I trust in you. You are the king. I love you. And experience that great joy and the blessing of being together continually. And so that's what we do. That's what we do here at Lighthouse. I mean, next week, next Sunday, you are invited back. Come with us. We're going to have an awesome uh, guest speaker that's going to be here that's going to encourage you. And we're going to have a potluck. Who doesn't love a church potluck? And then two weeks from now, we're going to have uh, uh, kick off a whole new sermon series about the junk we've gone through the last two years and how Jesus Christ helps us come through some of that stuff of anxiety and isolation, disunity, and gives us hope. My hope, my, my prayer, my earnest desire for all of you is that you would do that. Not just come back to church and come on a Sunday, but you would come and experience that joy to bless God, to worship, to experience the amazing power of being part of his kingdom, laying down your life, because that's what he did. I'm going to pray for you now. And I encourage you to pray with me if this is your first time of maybe knowing and trusting Jesus. Father, we come before you humbled and in awe of your amazing love for us and power that you have. That God, you have the power to make our hearts burn within us. You have the power to open our eyes to understand you better. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would do that kind of work that I can't do as a preacher, that that no human can do, that only you can do, God, that you would open hearts and eyes right now to hear the good news that we are sinful and Christ died for us and he rose to give us new life right here, right now. And Father, even though we we walk out of here into a cold and snowy and, and maybe kind of a uh, hard life, we know that we have Jesus in us, the, the reigning, living Lord. And so, God, once again, we lay down our, our life. We, we submit to you. We say, God, I trust in you. I am sorry. I, I ask for your forgiveness and pray that you would, you would surround me with your loving arms today to show me your great love. God, thank you for, for raising Jesus from the dead to be our Savior. We just worship and praise you now and pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.